Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Hortz Dairyman monthly webinar series. First of all, I'd like to say happy June Dairy Month to everyone, um, all of our dairy friends out in the audience. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an editor for Hortz Dairyman magazine. The title of today's presentation is Reimagining the Future of Dairy, Maintaining Our Social License by Improving Animal Welfare. Many common practices on dairy farms are subject to criticism by today's consumers and even some of our stakeholders. On, on the webinar today, we'll focus on some of our approaches of how we've handled these concerns in the past and some alternative options for moving <coughs> forward. This webinar is sponsored by the Dairy Cattle Welfare Council. As their name suggests, this, web, this organization is focused on improving the well-being of dairy cattle on today's farms. And we are grateful for their support of this webinar. My co-host for today is Mike Hutchins, a professor emeritus from the University of Illinois. And our other team members include Patty Hurchin, our online media manager here at Horde Steerman, and Jim Baltz, our <laughs> webinar producer at the University of Illinois. If you're listening to the presentation, you have access to the PDF slides and you can print those out. You just go to the GoToWebinar control panel, click on the handout section, and there you can get a copy of the presentation plus some information about our sponsor for today's program. Also, if you have any questions that come up during the webinar, please type them into the questions section and we will answer them following the presentation. Um, I'm very pleased to have as our speaker today, Nina von Kieserlink, a professor from the University of British Columbia. I met Nina several years ago when she was visiting Wisconsin for some presentations. And ever since then, I've always been very interested and impressed by the research that they do in the areas of animal well-being and consumer perception. So I'm very glad that we were able to add her to our schedule of webinars for this year, and I look forward to hearing her presentation. Mike, if you would please um, introduce Nina a little further, and then we'll get started. Well, Abby, thank you very much, and it's my uh, per personal and professional uh, privilege to introduce Nina. Uh, she grew up on a, a beef a cattle ranch in British Columbia, got her undergraduate <clears throat> degree from the University of British Columbia, a master's from Animal Science, University of Alberta, and her PhD at the University of British Columbia. She then worked several years as a research scientist in a animal feed industry before joining the staff at British Columbia. Uh, currently, she is chairman uh, or chair of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada Industrial Research and Animal Welfare Group. That's a big title. She has over 265 peer-reviewed publications and has received awards from the American Dairy Science Association, the uh, Elanco Award for Excellence. From Canada, she received uh, the Canadian Animal Industries Award in Extension and Public Service. She also received an award in 2018 from Switzerland from one of their research groups over there as well. So Nina, we are very excited to have you here today on a very exciting topic, very controversial. We'll turn the program over to you. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> and thank you to Hordes um, for inviting me. Abby, asked, I can't even remember when you asked me um, to do this, but it was a while ago. A lot has happened in the world since then. But it's uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I also wanted to thank the Dairy Cattle Welfare Council for sponsoring me. And I wanted to give a special thank you to Jim, who helped me with the slides. For those of you watching on a cell phone, the fact that you can see this and it's not cut off anywhere, is uh, due in to his um, expertise in preparing slides for these sort of uh, uh, presentations. So we're going to start out with a poll, and um, uh, I'm going to ask you to make a decision. Um, which of the following management practices do you think will make the lay public most uncomfortable, if they're aware? Zero grazing, cow-calf separation, individual housing of calves, and painful procedures. And, and sorry, I'm going to force you to make a decision um, because I, I don't think we can do sort of click all or something like that. Well, very good. The polls are now opening and uh, we're off and running at this point. Wow, we, we've got a big vote. Uh, oh, Abby, you always get to uh, put your two cents worth in here or if you're going to vote, which one would you select that um, to the answer that the public are most uncomfortable with? Yeah, well, I think they obviously all could be correct. I think the most current concern that I am hearing about, learning about through different conferences is the cow-calf separation issue. Um, what do you think, Mike? Yeah, I agree with you there. We're going to close the poll because we got a big vote in here, 84%. Uh, well, here we go. Uh, 
Nina, what do you think? Well, I, I can't see the results. Oh, there it is. <clears throat> so 45% say painful procedures. Uh, interesting, only 3% say individual housing, and I'm going to get back to this uh, at the very end because there's a question about that. Um, Cow-calf separation. You guys, I think all of you are right, and um, a lot of these issues <clears throat> are going to come up during the presentation, um, but it is, what it does tell me is that you are aware that some things, you know, may not resonate with your with your constituents, meaning the consumer, the citizens. I'm going to say before I go into the ne the beginning of this uh, the rest of my presentation, I just want to talk for two seconds, and just basically lay the ground, lay the the, uh, the put the thought out there that I absolutely expect that much of this presentation is going to make many of you very very uncomfortable, and so and that's okay. Um, the dairy industry is going through some changes, and change can be very, very scary. But what I'm also hoping is that at the end of this, you'll also see that change can be uh, may sort of can be opportunity. So I just wanted to say that that it's okay if you feel uncomfortable. Um, that's part of of this process is to start talking about some of these things. Some cow calf separation. Many, many of you commented on that being a big issue. This is just um, from the Guardian. This was in June of 2019. Um, the Guardian is a very big newspaper in the United Kingdom, and this was a, an article on rise of ethical milk. Mums ask when cows and their calves are separated. Um, we see in some of the European magazines, main, um, mainstream newspapers, a lot of stories now coming out about the lives led by farm animals. But it's not just Europe. This was an article published at the end of December in the New York Times. Um, if any of you have seen that, you will see that I'm quoted in that article. Just to give a bit of background, I spent almost three hours talking to this reporter over the span of about, uh, well, I think it was two, two uh, basically on my cell phone talking to them each time, about an hour and a half, and then a bunch of emails back and forth. At the end of the day, um, this article, I was, different dairy organizations um, emailed me and said it was reasonably well balanced. Um, I tried hard and I worked, and this reporter, I have to give all the respect to him. He listened to what I have to, had to say and tried to give a more balanced approach. The interesting thing about this article is if you go to this article, there was over, I think, close to 2,000 comments about the article. And I've I mean, I didn't count them all, but 98% of them were anti-dairy. So this is, the, this is the state of the game right now, is there's lots of people who are not happy with dairy, and this conversation's in increasing. So I want to talk about the social license to practice and, and give you some, um, just an idea of what this means, because we use these words a lot, but we don't always know what they mean. Basically, this is according to Bernie Rowland, who is a philosopher um, who's just retired out of Colorado. The social license to practice is given to agriculture. And based on basically, there's three parts to this. It's given to industries um, by society. And so food, animal, well, all farmers have been given social license to practice by society because society doesn't really understand the profession enough to well enough to regulate it so the social license is given um, however when in giving the social license there's also trust in the sector so the public trusts farming that they'll self-regulate themselves in ways that follow societal values as if society did understand the sector the challenge is is that the third part here, if the food production sector fails to self-regulate properly, then society will intervene and regulate the industry, despite acknowledging that they don't understand the industry. And it's this last part that is, you know, I don't think anybody in agriculture actually wants to get there, where somebody outside of our sector is regulating the sector that doesn't have any clue about that sector. But we see this in terms of in Europe, we see a lot of regulations coming, and that's because society is basically no longer happy with how food production systems are being self-regulated. 
So I'm going to talk about four things. You know, how do we respond to all this criticism? These 2,000 people in the New York Times article that was criticizing dairy, how do we respond to that? Do we close the barn doors? I'm going to talk about educating the public. Then I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've done engaging the public. And last, I hope to end on a, what I would view as a positive way forward, but is leading the process. So one, one way to deal with criticism is just simply to shut the door. And this was a big thing in the United States, sort of 2008, 10, 2010, was this idea of the introducing the ag-gag laws, where basically it prohibited the processing or taking of photographs, video, or audio recordings on farms without consent. So this undercover video scenario that people came in, took undercover videos um, as in because they had gotten themselves on as employees, and then when they then they uploaded the, the videos. And so we I had a student at that time, Jesse Robbins, who worked for eight years for the um, Washington State Dairy Federation. It was and his role with the Washington State Dairy Federation had been to sort of keep an eye on what was happening in terms of regulations and, and sort of the government interactions. And so we asked the questions about, you know, if people were aware about the egg gag laws, um, does would that reduce the credibility of the farmers and perceptions of farm animal well-being? So basically, were there counterproductive effects of this reduced but transparency? By implementing the law, were we were we were there some negative effects in terms of public trust? And so what Jesse did is we set up an online survey and we used Mechanical Turk, which is part of Amazon Prime. Um, so people that sign up for Amazon Prime can say, tick a box saying that they're willing to answer questions and, and then they get sent all these questions um, and they can pick the ones that they want to participate, surveys, and then they can pick the ones that they want to participate in. And in this case, um, people that elected to do our survey were brought in and they were basically, everybody came into the survey and they were um, given, a, uh, started out with a question, a simple question. Do you believe that farm animals in the United States have a reasonably good life? Straightforward, simple question. And they answered on a Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree on that sentence. And then they were put into one of two treatment groups. Half the people were told about the egg gag laws. We didn't use the word egg gag. We just said that at that time, I think it was uh, 11 or 15 states uh, were implementing these laws that if people got caught, that they could be prosecuted. I got caught um, taking these um, undercover videos that they could be prosecuted. The other half were just simply told about hay. This is a common, feed stuff that are fed to many farm animals. We balanced the two information capsules in terms of word count, cognitive load, those sort of things. And then we asked them again, how confident are you that farm animals have a good life? And then we asked a bunch of other questions. So interesting here is that this is now in terms of percent agreed. So how many people that participate in the survey agreed with the statement that farm animals have good lives. And what you can see control were the people that had the hay treatment and the treatment people were told about the egg gag laws. And what we can see is that we basically reduced trust, that they just didn't, you know, as soon as, I think the issue here is if you're preventing people from taking pictures and stuff, what else are you hiding? And so this, we, we were starting to see that for them, it really mattered. Open door transparency seems to be really important for the public. One of the other questions that we asked were participants exposed to information about egg gag laws were less likely to agree to the sentence that farmers are trustworthy sources of information. So again, those participants that were told about hay, about 64% of them agreed with this statement, but this was almost dropped by two thirds. Those people that were told about the egg gag laws simply didn't think, um, were very reluctant to say that farmers were trustworthy sources of information. So closing the barn doors, I don't think is the way to go. Um, I think it really messes with public trust and it really comes down to if you aren't transparent and you're, you're basically, what are you hiding? What about educating the public? And I think there's two parts to educating the public. And I'm going to talk about some the role of scientists, because I don't think we as scientists have helped the dairy industry. 
as well as we can. Um, and that comes down to, you know, telling the good stories and publicizing those good stories in, the, as, in my role as a scientist. So the cow brush. Uh, I had an undergraduate student, Emily McConaughey. She was doing her undergraduate thesis, and we were interested in how motivated cows were to access a mechanical brush. And so she trained these cows to push a weighted gait, and she did, she did it in two parts. First, she pushed, she trained them to push the weight to access the total mixed ration. And I can tell you, guarantee you, cows really love TMR, and they'll push an awful lot of weight to access the TMR after milking. And then what we did is we put the, this, this weighted gait, we made the cows work toward to get to a mechanical brush. Here you can see a cow coming and every day we increase the weight for the cow to get access to the brush. So for each of these individual cows, we knew how much weight she would push to go to the TMR and we could compare how much she would push to gain access to the mechanical brush. And what I can tell you is that cows love the mechanical brush and they will work just as hard to gain access to the mechanical brush, telling us that scratching is really important for them as they would to gain access to the TMR. So this is a scientific experiment. We published this in biology letters as an open access journal, uh, open access article, which means that anybody anywhere can see this. A week, so when we submitted this for publication, um, Emily, being the nice, the smart undergraduate student, she actually read all the details about what we were supposed to do when we were submitting this um, to the journal. And one of this was saying that we could um, include a picture and the editors would look at all the pictures from submitted by all the articles in that month's journal, and they would pick one for the front page of the article for the front page of the journal. And they picked our journal, our, our, our picture for the front page of Biology Letters Up. And then the other thing is that they make a week before it becomes public, I had no idea about this, but they can, reporters can access the articles a week before they become public and ask questions to the, to the authors and get their quotes. And I remember all, you know, I've been driving down the road listening to my radio and I, you hear these, these the, the news reporters say, today in the New England Journal of Medicine, this paper was published and they talk about the results. And I always wondered, how do they know that? How can they write these stories so quickly? Well, I learned how to do that with this paper. A week before this was published, I was contacted by numerous reporters, including the New York Times, and they wrote this fantastic story about give a cow a brush and watch it scratch that itch. Um, it was on NBC as well. And all over the world, this, this paper became part of mainstream media. And these are things that I think as scientists, we need to do a better job is get our stories into the media, <clears throat> At least, you know, the positive ones. But how, what about educating the public? So for the next poll, I think, Mike, do you want to take over now? Sure, I can give you a quick break here. Here you go, get a chance to vote. We're going to vote quick. Do you think educating lay public about dairy farming will improve public perception? And there are three choices. One, yes. Two, no. Or three, I, I hope, but I'm not sure. So we're off and running here. And we've got... Um, I'm looking here to see at this point. Abby, how are you going to vote on this one? Yeah, I, I'm going with no. What do you say, Mike? Well, I'm going to go with I hope, but not sure as far as that goes. So uh, we're we're at 80%. So, Jim, let's share and see what uh, Nina thinks about uh, the answers. So 43% said I hope, but not sure. 45% said yes. And 12% said no. So great question. I'm not surprised at the variation in the answers because, you know, this is something that we hear about. My dad used to say, because I lived about 300 miles uh, from Vancouver, um, and we were a beef cattle rancher. And he used to say, Nina, when you're in Vancouver, just make sure that you educate the public, you know, that everything we're doing is really good. So what we did is we actually asked this as a question as we made this into a research study. And so here we asked the question, does access to knowledge shift public perceptions about current cat dairy cattle care practices? This was Beth Ventura, was a PhD student. She's now on staff uh, faculty at the University of Minnesota. And so, 
we these we have this thing called a slow food tour. So people that are really interested in where their food comes from can get on their bicycles and go around and visit all these farms. And the, our university dairy was one of those. So she interviewed 50 people. And the first thing she did was ask them about their concerns. And the number one concern that came up when she did her, she took all the 50 responses <clears throat> before they went on the tour. She took, she summarized these responses and was about the feed. And I remember back, saying to me, she goes, Nina, nobody actually said this, but it's like they think we feed them nuclear waste or something like that. The number two was many, many people commented about pasture and outdoor access and the fact that they were, they had had fears that the cows weren't outside, but they hoped that they were. Lots of questions about behavioral restriction. Um, and lastly, lots of concerns about abuse. And I have to say, we'd had a large undercover video about two months before this study in Western Canada. And so it, it, this didn't really surprise us. When she looked at all of their concerns and she sort of loop blocked them into different areas, about 72% of them were about biological functioning and health. So were these animals healthy and all that? Not surprising given, of course, because people you know, wanna make sure that the food that they eat is healthy. Lots of questions around this natural living. Were these animals living in environments that were sort of um, spoke to their natural, what they perceived to be their natural um, lives? And lots about sort of the emotional states of the animals, about 22% of the comments. Interesting, over half of the comments were about humane care. And definitely an acknowledgement that farmers were viewed to be experts and they in, in care, but we, it wasn't just that they were an expert, but that they had, they were given the, they were expected to accept this duty of care. And so the pub, these people expected the farmers to do the right thing. She then gave them a questionnaire. So this, they, these people had never been on a dairy farm. And these are five simple questions for people in the audience. You're going to probably laugh at how simple these questions are, but these are people that have no idea about dairying. So if we ask them, you know, a question, a dairy cow needs to have a calf to keep producing milk, true or false. 58% only got that right. Almost half didn't have a clue that in order to produce milk, a cow has to have a calf. We then asked um, dairy cows in British Columbia are routinely tied in their stall in the barn, true or false. British Columbia has about 470 farms and we have less than, I think it's only six tie stalls left in the province. All dairy cows in British Columbia are allowed access to pasture, true or false? The answer to this is false um, because the majority of the dairy system now in this province is zero grazing. We asked a question about cow-calf separation. How many days after birth does a dairy calf typically stay with its mom? Zero days, one week, one month, never separated. Interesting, about 25% got this right, and which tells me that they probably had no clue and they just guessed. So, you know, you pick one in four, about 25% will pick zero days. And then the last one was about the diet that cows get fed milk, grass, or premixed feed, and about 74%. So on average, three, they got three of five questions. They then went, oh, the last, then she asked them before they went on the tour, how confident are you that dairy cattle have a good life? 42% said they were confident, 30% were neutral, and 28% were not confident. They then went on a self-guided tour of the dairy, and they, we had eight stations. Um, they learned about calf management, including cow-calf separation. They learned about the Canadian guidelines for on-farm animal care, which is very similar to the farm program in the U.S., they learned about a typical day in the life of a dairy cow. They learned about cow health, feeding, reproduction, and general behavior. She then, when they came out of the tour, she tested them again. And yes, she showed that we could increase knowledge. So they went from on average three of five questions to four of five questions. And I want you to particularly see the issue of separation. We went from 26% to 76%, you know, a huge increase in knowledge there. But across the board, we increased knowledge. She interviewed them again, and for some people, the tour really it did help. So some perceptions improved. Here is somebody that before said, I'm concerned about humane treatment, cramped living conditions, and access to grazing. After, the animals seem very well cared for on this farm. The practices on this farm seem very ethical but some perceptions worsened. 
Here is somebody that said before, I never had any concerns. After, I would still prefer to see animals grazing in the fields, eating the grass and calves not separated so quickly from their mothers. So the issue here is if education works, then we should get an increase in confidence to the question of how confident are you that dairy cattle have a good life? And that's not what we found. 42% dropped to 28%. Um, what's interesting here is the biggest change was in, in also, we also saw a lot of people now on the fence. We did, you know, improve a little bit. You know, we went from 28% non-confident to 18% non-confident. But what concerns me here is the lack of confidence and this huge neutral thing. So people are now, whoa, I'm not so sure anymore. And this to me is a risky thing. So I really don't think just education is going to work. Um, we're not education is not going to be sort of the salvation out of this these criticisms people were very pleased to see the high level of care and attention they talked about how wonder the wonderful the food was and how caring the farmers were but they were absolutely displeased about cow calf separation and the lack of pasture outdoor access so i don't think educating the public in terms of um us just preaching from the top down is going to work We've been doing lots of work on engaging the public on these hugely contentious issues. And there's just lots of pictures here. Um, I'm not gonna talk about tail docking, um, but I'm gonna briefly talk about, you know, what do the public think about tie stall and then spend some time because this seems to be two really big issues are pasture and cow-calf separation. We know from the animal other, other animal industries that restriction of movement is makes people really uncomfortable. And most of you, you know, have heard about the criticisms that the egg industry has had in terms of their, their cages and that the pig industry or the, the, um, when has had in terms of gestation stalls. You know, the public, they look at this and you get these terms like it's not natural and they get really wiggly. Well, we know that, I mean, in Canada, we still have 73% of the farms um, are tie stall. Um, in the US, I believe it's around 40, 42%, very small proportion of cows, but there's still lots of farms that are tie stall. So Jesse, as part of his PhD, also looked at this issue of you know, public acceptance to tie stall housing. And we actually did it in terms of asking, we told people about tie stall housing, a small vignette, and then we asked them whether or not they would be uh, supportive of a ban for like if in the US you call them propositions in some of your states, the most famous one I think is proposition two in California. Um, when they <clears throat> ask people about whether or not animals should be housed in such a way that they can extend their wings or limbs fully and turn around uh, 360 degrees. And in California, I think it was 70 some odd percent people voted, you know, in favor of supporting a ban of um, these types of housing systems. Interesting, only 2% of the participants said they'd even heard about tie stall housing. And then when we asked them about the, whether or not they would vote in favor of a ban, 65% said they would ban tie stalls and 35% said they would, only 35% said they would oppose. Them. So this is something to me is, is writing on the wall is I think for those of you that have tie stall housing systems, we already know in Europe that they're transitioning out of those is, you know, what's the plan for the next 20 years? Now to come back to cow-calf separation and pasture. Um, this is a picture from what a very common picture that you see in grocery stores when it comes to selling of milk. Um, you often see pictures with cows with their calves together and on grass. And, you know, I think the people that are marketing are very, very smart about what they do. What they're doing is they're putting pictures that they know resonate with the core values of their milk buyers. The challenge that we have is that that picture of a cow and a calf together on pasture is not what the industry is, does. And that is a risky place to be. So, Cow-calf separation, I can tell you that outside of the North America, this is one of the hottest discussion points in Australia, in Europe. People are asking questions about this. So one of the things that we were interested in is looking at different cow-calf management systems. And one of the things is to do science is expensive. To do you know, a study 
looking at, um, let's say, the foster cow system? Would this be an alternative management practice that we could potentially go down, similar to what the caged, the egg industry did when it came to the battery cage? They put millions of dollars into research looking at the furnished cage. We have many egg organizations around the world that are um, transitioning to the enriched cage. When was the last time you were in a grocery store where they talked about the eggs coming from an enriched cage? We see caged eggs and we see free run and free range eggs. And we already see in Europe that the this these bigger cages is just not acceptable by the public. So millions of euros and millions of dollars were put into this type of research for what? For a system that never really resonated with public, with the public. And so one of the questions that we had is the whole foster cow system. You know, I've had many farmers, many producers phone me or email me and say, look, you know, if I were to make a change, do you think, you know, the foster cow system, will that work? To do research on foster cow systems is really expensive. And so what we decided to do was to see whether or not we could do, uh, do research on, you know, would this be acceptable by the public? So as a start, I'm going to ask you, do you think the public will accept cow calf, uh, a foster cow system as an alternative type of cow calf management system? Okay, Nina, we'll give you a quick break here. Do you think, uh, get ready to vote, go vote quick, vote fast. Do you think the lay public will accept uh, cow calf separation systems if the calves are raised by foster or nurse cows here? And the answer is yes, no, and maybe. So, uh, Abby, uh, here's your chance to get one right. What do you think? <laughs> I think I've been doing pretty well so far, Mike. Um, another one that really makes you think. I am going to select no. Mike, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to go with you on this one here. I think you got it right here. We've got uh, a pretty good percent of the vote in here. I still don't see it, Jim. Do you? Anyway, um, let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and close the let's go ahead and close the poll, and uh, hopefully, Nina, you can see the results here. Uh, yes, now I can. Okay. Nineteen percent said yes. Forty-two percent said no, and thirty-nine percent said maybe. And for those that said no or maybe, I would love to be able to have a conver conversation with you to ask why you think not. So um, I will agree with you. Um, I don't think. Well, I guess. I should say that we, we actually did this as a research study. It's much cheaper to do um, a study of people. Um, and so I had a master's student, Laura from California, that did this study where we basically asked, and this is a representative uh, sample of Americans, so nearly 1,500 individuals in this data set, where we just, you know, and this, this, to do this type of research is much, much cheaper than doing 10 studies on, to figure out how to make a foster cow system work. So I use these types of studies to basically help guide what will not be acceptable down the road or how do we you know, save spending lots of money like the poultry people did on all this work on enriched cages that ultimately the public doesn't accept. So Laura looked at three, at, at four different treatments. People came into the survey, they were told that cows have to have a calf to produce milk. And in three of the treatments, um, they were told that the calf is separated. And one of those treatments, we said the calf was individually housed. And the other one, we said the calves were, were socially housed. And in the third one, we said they were reared with a foster cow system. And in the fourth treatment, we basically said the cows and calves would stay together. And the farmer milks, the, in each case, we said the farmer milks the cow. And then we asked people um, what their perceptions were in terms of uh, welfare of the cows and calves. Um, and when we started out with this, I thought individual would be the least liked, pair would be next, followed by foster cow, followed by the cow-calf contact system be being most um, acceptable. That is not what we found. So these are Likert scales from one to seven, basically the perceptions of welfare from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And what you can see here is that it's all about separation. They hate the fact that we're taking the cow and the calf, we're separating them. Interesting, the cow-calf system 
a contact system rated 4.9. So it wasn't a positive, but it wasn't seven. And I think this just speaks to that, you know, dairy farming is more than just one thing. But it just makes us think that I don't think if, you know, we should move forward at this point based on this evidence um, with the foster cow system as the way forward. Just want to speak briefly about pasture. Um, we also asked uh, representatives, oh, not a representative, we asked a question about whether or not cows should have access to pasture. Um, and this is a lay public sample and 90% said yes, about 10% were neutral. They had to tell us why they answered that the way they did. The neutral people had concerns about the environment. The take home message here is that nobody said no. So here we are, we have this great divide. You know, we have a dairy cow, a dairy housing system. This is a picture of our research dairy. Um, it's a freestall barn. Almost cows, uh, our heifers go out on pasture, but the cows never go out on pasture. To this picture that the public has of the dairy industry, which is cows on pasture with calves at foot. Lots of criticism, and this is this is we are so far apart. So how do we move forward? And I just want to talk about some of the work we've been doing in terms of leading the process. And part of this is getting the dairy industry to start thinking about what, how do they see their future. You go to any business and you hear about, at some point, and employees always grumble a little bit, but about strategic planning. And this is where you get everybody together, where you talk about what is your vision of your industry? What is the mission statement? And then, you know, an operational plan on how to achieve that vision. And I think this is something that animal agriculture has to do because otherwise somebody's going to tell us what to do. We've been doing lots of work about focus groups. Focus groups can help build relationships and create dialogue. We can discuss and identify shared values and begin to develop a vision for the industry and how this can be achieved. And I'm, I'm just gonna show you some results of a, a bunch of different studies that we've been doing this with different stakeholders within the dairy sector. So this is work where in all of these cases, we essentially put people in the context, in the focus group, um, where we say, okay, let's fast forward to the year 2050. You're hoping that your grandchildren will take over your farm. In your ideal world, what does this farm look like? And then we have some leading uh, open-ended questions where, you know, what characteristics would you consider to be must-haves in order for them to want to take over the farm? Are there farm characteristics common today that you think would make farming less attractive for your grandchildren? You know, what are some of the things that you have to deal with today that just, you know, give you angst, you know, if you could leave those behind? And what do we need to do to achieve your vision of the fu this future farm? This is just a word cloud. Um, Carolyn Ritter, as part of her postdoc with me, we did um, seven focus groups of, of 25 farmers in Western Canada. These were their must-haves. They talked lots about cow comfort. The bigger the word, the more often this word came up. Interesting, front and center was this recognition that the consumer will play an increasing role in this. Frustration about the consumer also came up. They talked about management, they talked about uh, technology, welfare, these sort of things. The next one is a word cloud that came out of, this is the leave behinds, but these were veterinarians that I spoke to the Ontario bovine practitioners who support dairy farming. And it was interesting when I um, asked them about the leave behinds. What do they wanna leave behind? They wanna leave behind lame cows. They wanna leave behind this bull calf issue. They want to leave behind the issues around pain and dehorning. They don't know how to talk about hormone use in the dairy industry. They talk, you know, slatted floors, veal, all of these things that they would love to leave behind. We also did this in the pig industry. Um, and for the last one is sort of what is your vision for moving forward? They had um, an interesting, you know, um, set of basically we summarized all the conversations and i think it was six or seven focus groups and um at this was at the pig welfare symposium in minneapolis and i think it was 2018 or 2019 just before covid started their vision was it should be industry-led that research should pave the way and i think there was this acknowledgement openness to change 
They were looking for continued engagement between consumers and the industry. And a very big, oops, very big recognition <clears throat> that we need to sit down as an industry and decide what our values are. And that's really what I'm hoping for the dairy industry to do. Sit down, decide what your values are and how to move forward. We need to also listen and share lessons learned within the industry around the world. And there was lots of talk about minimum standards and enforcement that, you know, can as these industry, what about those bad actors? Those, 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 you know, very few farms, but those farms that make the rest of the industry look bad. How do we deal with those? Everybody knows as soon as there's an undercover video, it hurts everybody. So in terms of take home points, closing the barn doors erodes trust. One way educational efforts are likely to fail. Sustained two way engagement can help. The industry needs to articulate its core values and develop a corresponding vision. But it also needs to, you know, this plan on how to move forward. And I think part of this means that you've got to also be willing to engage with, with the public and try to figure out solutions that res where the solutions will obviously work for the cows and work for the farmers, but that they resonate with societal values. Because if you don't do that, you're really messing with public trust, which will mess with the social license that has been given to you. Somebody else is gonna come in and start to regulate you. And I think what's also key is that you have to give the notion of that you're trying to get better. So, you know, there's lots of things that we do now that we didn't do a long time ago because we've adapted, we've learned, we've changed. And so we need to embrace that as an opportunity. So on that note, thank you. Um, this is just a picture of some work that we've done on social housing of calves. Um, and I think here the, the big issue is, is, and I know that there's one of the questions that's gonna come is, is going to be about individual housing. And I really truly believe that we have to move on from individual housing. It's, it's something that the public is not going to accept in the long run, but we can talk about that more later. Very good. Thank you very much, Nina, for sharing your thoughts and research with us today. I know these topics can be hard to discuss at times, but it seems that they will be part of the dairy industry moving forward. And um, we appreciate you sharing your insights and some of your leadership in this area as um, our dairy industry progresses forward. So thank you for your time today. Once again, I'd also like to thank the Dairy Cattle Welfare Council for serving as a sponsor for this webinar. And this is obviously a topic that fits into their realm of work and what their organization stands for. So we appreciate them partnering with us today. If you would like to view this webinar again or share it with someone else, it will be posted online by the end of this week. And you can find this webinar and all of our other recorded webinars at our website, which is hordes.com backslash webinars. Um, we hope that you'll make plans to attend our future webinars, which always take place on the second Monday of each month. In July on the 12th, we will have Carl Berge, who comes to us um, as a hoof care expert and hoof care consultant. And his presentation is titled Three Points to Exceptional Hoof Health. He um, is a, a founder of the Save the Cows Network, and he'll be discussing lameness prevention through functional trimming, reducing inflammation, and proper flooring design. Then in August, we have a presentation by Bill Weiss from The Ohio State University, and he'll be talking about energy and estimating energy supply and requirements of dairy cows. Um, so please mark your calendars and make plans to attend those two future webinars with our group. Then if you move forward, we had a few questions that came in prior to the presentation. And if you're a registered attendee, each month you will get a get an email that welcomes you to submit some questions. So we had some good participation this month. Mike, if you want to read these questions, and then we did have a number of questions that have come in. I will remind everyone in the audience that if you have any more questions, <coughs> feel free to type them in and we will work on answering those right now. So go ahead, Mike. You're very good, Abby. Well, here we go. Um, um, uh, Nina, uh, the first one comes from California. How do you or we defend the California style wooden calf hutches? I'm going to be really blunt here. Sorry, we don't. 
if I if you have these types of hutches, I think you need a transition plan. And you know, it, it, and I think that's part of what we uh, we have to acknowledge. There is lots and lots of evidence now that individual housing is not um, good for welfare. And so um, we have reduced cognitive deficits in these calves. They're they're more fearful um, when it comes to individual housing. So I think you know, if somebody asks you about this, the is to recognize and say, look, you know, this is what we used to do. Um, I'm working towards a plan to try to phase these out. Let's go to our next question then. And if you want to click on that uh, a little bit longer, one comes from Florida. A misguided consumer pressure is leading some farms to continue practices that research has shown to be less favorable, such as leaving calves with cows longer. How do you handle consumer pressure for practices that are not better for the animals? So, I mean, this is the thing where we know we've been doing this, the issue of cow-calf separation. Industry has long, long held on to the notion that this, we're doing the right thing from the research perspective, and this is now what's come out um, is, you know, we did two um, systematic reviews looking at cow-calf separation um, on calf health, cow, dairy cow and calf health. Um, I'm just going to, these pitch, these are open access journal articles. You can access them at any time or just send me an email. I can send them to you. Um, basically, the evidence, the available evidence says that we don't have the support. From, I can't give you the science to support cow-calf separation. That was on the, the health side, and we have the same thing on the behavior and production side, is that you know there is not strong evidence for why we do these things. So um, the only evidence is there is if you want to reduce vocalizations, then, then break the bond as fast as possible. But if collectively, I don't have enough evidence to, to show you that that's the right thing to do. What I would do here is I would say that, um, look, I used to only feed four quarts of milk a day uh, or four liters a day. Now I feed two and a half times that. And that's shown me, and I feed, I don't used to feed out of a bucket. Now I nipple feed my calves. If I do all those things, I can group house calves or socially house calves. They're smarter. They um, uh, transition better from through the weaning period. They do all these things, um, less fearful. And in 20, 25 years of research can show me how to keep cows and calves together in a way that, you know, is good for the cows, good for the health, uh, good for the calves. The, I don't go broke. I'm the first to change. Okay. We have a question from Oregon. It says, I'm interested in your thoughts about keeping calves on cows. Is there work being done that, uh, that is looking at the welfare, health, and feasibility? There is work being done, um, not in North America. We are a little bit behind in all of that. Um, I think in large part because, I mean, right now, nobody really wants to fund this topic, but it is the hottest research topic in Europe right now. And it's also gaining huge traction in Australia and New, New Zealand. I know of one big four or five year study being done in Sweden where they're looking at all of this. They're looking at reproduction, economics, um, the health of the cows, the health of the calves. and so. This research is coming. It's going to take some time, but there are over a thousand farmers that participate in a Facebook page in Scandinavia, mostly out of Norway, where right now they're asking questions amongst themselves on how to do this because science has left them behind. So it's coming, but um, it's going to take a little bit of time. But if you want to, I had an email the other day from somebody in Switzerland because um, they were, there was a call for research specific to this topic by the Swiss government. Okay, I think that's our last question, right? Uh, that came in ahead of time. Oh, one more from one Kentucky. More, yeah. Very good. Uh, most researchers demonstrate that when the public is informed of our standard procedures, they think less fondly of dairy than previously. I'm especially thinking about the cow-calf removal. However, we cannot uh, just not inform the public either. How do we bridge the gap? So I think we bridge the gap in part by telling the story that I just said about, you know, what, what, how, what you're trying to do is you're trying, we, we have a differences in values right now. And so what you're trying to do is find common ground. And the worst thing we can do, I think, to our, to somebody asking you questions about this and says, well, look, you just don't understand my business. I got this. You're much better off to come up with trying to say, look, I recognize that you think that you don't like this. I you know, if I've heard, 
I heard farmers tell me this is the worst thing that they have to do on the farm. They don't know how not to do it. They have to do it. But resonate, find common ground. The other thing is, is I think the last thing that we should do is not talk about it because the risk is if we don't talk about it, don't acknowledge this, somebody will find out about it like an undercover video or something and then we lose trust. Just so you're aware, there are certain dairy organizations around the world now who are actually have this front facing on their public website. The Dairy Farmers of Australia, um, they have a statement where they say dairy farmers have been encouraged to remove cows from calves for a few major reasons. And they give they list the ones that we always talk about, which is we got to harvest the milk. They, we think it's better for health of the calves and so on and so forth. Um, and then they follow this by saying this is an area of renewed research as the welfare of both the cow and calf have been questioned. This is an area requiring further in investigation into the practicalities and impact on animal health and welfare. That's front facing on their website. Okay, we are now going to the speed round here. First of all, farmers, farms have social media pages, uh, can have a huge impact on educating consumers. Do you agree with that? <laughs> so the thing is, is that we tend to only tell the stories that we want to tell. So I'm all for transparency. It's, uh, you know, for sure, talk about, you know, make sure that we're, we come across as, as an open book. But the problem then is if we only tell the stories that we're proud of and we don't talk about our, our the things that we're uncomfortable about, it can be a, it, that can be in itself risky. So we just, you know, we give these, these great stories all the time and then all of a sudden somebody finds out that, you know, we, if, to be harsh, looking at the Jersey industry, the, you know, how many of those male calves are euthanized on farm the minute they're born because there's no market for them. These are risky things for the dairy industry. So yes, it's good about transparency, but don't think that this is going to make up for all the challenges that we have in terms of public perception. Okay, uh, another question. As we are developing these alternative husbandry options, such as the enriched cages, is there a complementary research that determines if these changes really are gonna make a difference? Meaning science versus uh, the behavior. So at the end of the day, um, we know from um, the consumer, and so oh, let me well, let me start that a different way. The people in agriculture, and my dad was the same way, but said, okay, I'll change practice if the consumer is willing to pay more. You guys, that's a very risky statement because what you're doing is putting the sustainability of your industry on the shoulders of an uninformed client. And so, you know, those of you working in the dairy industry, how much do you know about the details of the broiler industry? How much do you know about the details about the egg industry? What about the beef industry? What about all these other animal industries? Probably not as much as you know about the dairy industry. And if we're gonna use that logic that they, you know, if they pay more will change, that means that they've gotta be an expert in everything, which they're never going to be. We know from here some work, we're looking at the furnished cage that when it comes to, we had in one of our major grocery stores, they have little information bullets now that, you know, the cheapest eggs are the conventional eggs that say nothing, but there's a little thing saying caged hens, behavioral frustration. And then we go from the left to the right with organic free run um, at the one end and sort of the cage free stuff, which is no cages, but no outdoor access in the middle. When those signs went up, we saw a shift in purchasing behavior from the left to the right. And interesting, the biggest shift went from free run to free range. People had already elected to make a price, to pay an increased price, thought that they were buying something where the birds had access to the outdoors, um, but didn't, and then shifted to the right. So yeah, it's, um, I think we, what we have to decide as an industry, what is the minimum standard gonna be? Okay, here's kind of a long question. I'll read most of it. Uh, you may have touched on part of it. In answering your question, the reason I voted no uh, as far as uh, separating the calf from the cow is that I think the public believes cows have negative consequences of separation as well as the calves. If we ask whether people believe calf was, uh, was well in the foster system, many people might agree, but they would still carry concerns about the mother cow as well. Comment? So the issue is is that we know almost nothing about the effects of cow-calf separation on the cow. 
uh, it's a huge empty, empty field of research. But let me put it this way. I would argue that many dairy farmers are not in the business of managing milk production. They're in the business of managing disease. We know that the time after calving is one of the most vulnerable times for those, for those cows. If I were a critic of the dairy industry, especially in the absence of any science, I would say the reason that all these cows are getting sick is because we separate the cow and the calf. There is evidence in the human literature that women that suffer from postpartum de um, depression are more at risk for other, for other things. Could be that these cows are suffering from postpartum depression and we don't know about it. This is the risk that we have working in a field in the absence of science. We've been doing research on nutrition and sorry, Mike, but for how many hundreds of years on looking at trying to improve cow health? And we still have many, many cows that get sick. Well, not in Illinois, but we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> the, the question is, could you post a link to your study with pushing weights to get to a brush? Do you, yes, do you, uh, I can. I, I'll, 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 yes, I'll figure out how to do that. <laughs> yeah, if, if you can get it to us, perhaps Jim yes. can put it in. Yeah, uh, I can put it. It's an open access that article. Point. Okay, very good. Write that down. Number, uh, next question. What do you see as a way to pr uh, practically transition uh, to keeping keeping calves on? Uh, will older cows accept uh, nursing calves, for example? So there's very little research. The research that has been done on nurse cows is that it is um, very variable. The cow has a lot to say and there's lots of challenges with it. However, you know, I'm not sure if that's the way I would go. I would definitely on my farm try to figure out how to do social housing of calves. Pair housing is a great way to go. Um, but in order to pair house, you've got to feed calves more milk. You've got to have them nipple fed. They'll grow faster for you. You've got to, weaning becomes a challenge, but there's ways that you can to reduce the stress around weaning. And lo and behold, there's lots of research now that shows that she'll produce more milk for you down the road. Um, so those are things that we can do. I would not at this point jump to foster cow systems because I don't think the public's going to accept it. You know, we did that representative sample in the U.S. We did another convenient sample in Canada. We got exactly the same results. Okay, here's an interesting one. When you did uh, when taking lay public uh, uh, concerns, were these all adults or youth, or would there be a difference if you seg segregated by those two categories? So we did, uh, in order to consent, you had to be um, in the U.S. 18 years and older, uh, in Canada 19 years and older in order to consent in the survey. Do we see um, differences in demographics? Yeah, women tend to be a little bit harder on the dairy industry than, um, than men. We, older people, I mean, the younger generation, the millennials are, can be quite harsh. And I think that's a big wake up call because they're the future. They're your future consumer. And they, they are very, very critical. Um, we also see a difference in terms of rural versus urban. Of course, you know, the urban people are more critical of agriculture than um, the rural people. But, you know, don't hold on to that being the way out, too, because the majority of your consumers live in urban settings now. Well, kudos to you. Here's the next one. Thank you for sharing your research. It was very informative. What's the next, in quotes, big thing that you think will affect the dairy industry? Uh, hormones, individual housing. What, what, what's, I guess, right now, the hottest thing right now is cow-calf separation. What's the next big one? Yeah, so I don't think, in, the, in North America, we're talking about cow-calf separation, but I don't think it's going to be the one that we're going to solve the fastest because it's, it's just challenging on, you know, how do you, how do, you do this? I think we have to recognize that it is an issue. The biggest issue I think facing North America right now are the surplus calves. So these calves, these male calves, um, and with now with the address, we're trying to deal with that by using sex semen on the top part of the herd and then using beef semen on the bottom part of the herd and trying to increase the value of those calves, which is a good thing. However, with that, you know, we still have a lot of calves that are euthanized directly, healthy calves that are euthanized on farm. The, that's a huge, huge issue coming, and we have to have a plan for that. And it will likely be totally tangled up with cow-cow separation. We have the Europe, in Europe, we've got Great Britain that has come out with their 2020 to 2023 strategy, where they are now announcing, as of January 1st, 2023, they will no longer euthanize 
any healthy calf on farm. We're seeing the same thing in um, Ireland. So these are things that are facing the dairy industry um, that we, we need to start figuring out. And there'll be lots of criticism. Next question. How far do you think we are in having some regulation on tie stall housing in North America? I don't see really any tie stall housing um, regulation on in animal care, animal welfare is challenging in North America, um, both in the United States and in Canada for the same reason. Animal cruelty, at least in Canada, we have a federal regulation, but that's really just cruelty. Animal care is governed at the provincial level and the same in the United States, animal care is governed at the state level. So to get consensus at the federal level in any of our two countries is going to be very difficult. That said, I think the biggest thing is that the dairy industry needs to come out with a plan and to say that the public really at the end of the day doesn't expect us to change overnight. They expect us to get better every day. And those are two very different things. And by saying, look, in 10 years or 20 years, we're going to phase out tie stall. We recognize there's problems with it. I think the public will give us that time, but we have to come out and with a plan. This comes back to visioning. Okay, what about uh, cross-sucking problems when you have paired housing? Nervous about that? No, I'm not nervous about that. As long as you're doing it, you're feeding those calves through lots of milk. So cross-sucking comes, it's a function of hunger. And so if you're not feeding your calves enough milk through um, a nipple, so mammals are highly motivated to suck. And one of the big challenges that we have is that we've tended to train calves to drink milk out of a bucket, so they're not able to elicit that natural behavior of sucking. So feed calves lots of milk through a nipple with a small hole so they have to work hard for it. And we've been incredibly successful at pair housing. But it's it's this, these steps that you have to take. You can't just go to pair housing and, and feed calves only four quarts of milk. It's gonna be a disaster. Here's a question that I would have asked, but someone else didn't. That is, do uh, you think the one study with 50 people uh, with one farm seemed adequate enough? And the same thing with the Amazon study. Uh, people pick the, those people that pick those questions. Would there be a bias in in in, in those is, surveys? Yeah, it's a good point. It's a convenient sample, but when we look at all the work that's been done on these public attitudes, um, my colleague um, Maria Jose Etzel in Brazil, we've done sort of surveys um, in Brazil um, on this issue of what are the big issues. I would say that the cow-calf separation and the, and the access to pasture is those, those are our things, those are things that the public's gonna get upset at. Whether or not there's 50 or a thousand, I think those things are gonna float to the top. Do you think the automiza uh, automatic uh, automization of uh, feeding milk to calves will have a positive influence in feeding cows? Uh, you know, auto automate it uh, so the, the calf can go in and, and, and consume milk when she wants or he wants to. Well, I mean, this whole AMS systems, I think, are going to be they're going to be the future. And, and back to this issue question that you raised about or somebody raised about demographics. The millennials and the Gen Zs and Gen, they all see technology in their future. I mean, how many of you have, you know, you're, I mean, I've got a 24 and a 21 year old. They can't imagine a world without technology. So I do see technology being part of animal agriculture. And I think we can use technology to help us move forward. And the AMS systems, the automatic milking systems are definitely going to be part of the future. In large part, because we can then also say the cow has the choice of going to get milked. An agency, lack of agency, um, which is a big issue that we're talking about now in the animal welfare literature is, you know, we've tended to house animals in such a way that they have no control over their environment. So the AMS systems will allow more for more control. They also could make, I know that the Swedes are doing their cow-calf separation work using, or their cow-calf contact studies with AMS systems. And it's, um, so those, I do see it as hugely part of the future. Okay, now we're going to the super fast round here to get our last ones done because we're a little bit late. Uh, will the public support finance uh, the research for certain type of housing systems? Where, who will support the research? <laughs> that's a great question. So that's gonna depend on where you're from. I mean, in Canada, I kudos to the Dairy, Dairy Farmers of Canada. I mean, I'm heavily funded by the Dairy Farmers of Canada. Um, 
Alberta Milk, um, all of this, you know, they haven't funded the cow-calf contact work, but we do have a mechanism for funding social good type of research. And it's been a big problem in the United States. Um, I remember being at National Milk years ago, your farm program, you know, that every farmer has that sort of governs sort of the industry-driven um, farm program. You look at all the references in the back of that manual that support the recommendations, something like 75% of that research is done outside of the U.S. And that's because nobody is willing to pay for farm type of research. That's a problem. Well, you're going to have to define artificial intelligence for me, but they want to know, will that be a bigger role in the future to inform our consumers? Um, I don't think it's going to be a bigger role to inform the consumers. I think it's going to be a bigger for, uh, it's going to play a big role in helping farmers do better on farm. So we're doing some work right now where we're looking at daily gate scores using AI technology. Um, you know, this going in and locomotion scoring a cow once a month, how, how, how good is that sort of approach? Would not, wouldn't it be better if we could locomotion score these cows every day? And so these cyber technologies, AI technologies, I mean, two of my graduate students are now computer science students. We have all of this data. And so I think we're going to be able to help dairy farmers make better decisions based on evidence. One of the conclusions would be that we are not self we are not self regulating this, but then giving license to people who don't understand the the, the situation. Uh, comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the problem is is that we're not listening to what the consumer wants. Um, we're not. We're just holding on to traditional practices. And I often, when I speak to, well, to just one, well, a couple comments. One is, I don't think we should be afraid of change. So I was in the UK and had like a thousand farmers in front of me and I was talking about cow-calf separation and a, and a farmer stood up and practically yelled at me and said, look, you know, this is, I can't, this isn't going to work and we just got to tell them that this is wrong, the public. And I said to them, and I said, look, how many of you are on a farm that 50 years ago was a tie stall facility? And most of them put up their hands. In the UK, there's hardly any tie stalls left. And I said, what do you think would have happened 50 years ago, if I would have told all of those farmers that the tie stall in 50 years would almost be obsolete in the UK. And one guy says, yeah, we would have yelled at you. And I said, yes. It could be that in 50 years, dairy farming looks very different than it does today. And that's okay. Change is not bad. We just need to embrace it and look for the opportunities and, and work with the public. How many of you drive a pickup truck that is less than five years old? Most, many people do. Well, you do that because you want improved gas efficiency, you want all the creature comforts. Do you think that Ford and Dodge Ram um, you know, don't know that? They're trying to figure out what you want and then they're trying to deliver that product. We're no different. Do you have a country that you think is doing the best job on welfare strategy? Do you have a, a superstar country? Is it Canada? Is it um, Well, I think every, I think Scandinavia is really pushing forward. It's a highly socialized country, so they've got lots of support for research. I would say in some of the stuff on the cow-calf separation side, they're leading the charge right now. Um, a country that I think is super interesting right now is Australia on the bobby calf issue. They are, they've tried to convince the public that killing calves at two weeks of age, these surplus calves is the right thing to do. Um, you know, I think all they're doing is creating more vegans. They've now decided to do a complete out, about face and they're doing what's called a deliberative democracy event. So they're going back to the community and back to all the stakeholders along the supply chain, including the community and the public and co-constructing a policy, getting everybody in right from the ground roots. And here's your last question. Uh, how, how do you handle, I'm not sure it's a fair question, how do you handle higher <laughs> mortality without more medication, drugs, in group housing calves that may be challenged with crypto or, uh, or mastitis challenges from milk that may contain organisms in them? So I think that, I mean, it's a really good question and it's a fair question. We see, so the research has been very clear. Um, Pair housing, smaller groups, less than eight calves. We see no difference as long as, you know, they're being fed properly and all those things in terms of disease rates compared to individual housing calves. 
The challenge we have is when we have big groups. So I am not a friend of any group size larger than eight or 10 calves. I recognize that these automatic milk feeders are expensive. Um, and so a lot of people try to put 20 calves. Well, of course you're gonna increase your risk of disease. The issue, and this is what I say to farmers, if you're moving to transition to your to group housing, don't go from one calf in pen, in hutches, to a group of 20. You've got to get your workers, everybody's got to, this is a learning process. So the easiest thing is to first feed with a nipple, feed more milk, get all of that working well, and then just simply do pair housing. And for many farms, they're going to stop at that. And it works really well, and you get all the benefits of social housing of group housing. Then if that's going well and you want to go a little bit bigger, you can maybe go to groups of four or eight but you gotta bring your, your staff along in all of this. I'll sneak in one more last question and uh, it's an interesting, how do you reconcile or make sense of the fact that consumers have a higher standard for cows than humans when it comes to separation and nursing? Well, Mike, I mean, that's a, that's a, I think we have to be very careful when we compare, when we justify practices in dairy by saying we should be putting our efforts more into humans. I think we got, we're got we better than that. We can do both. We, of course, have to ensure that mothers, you know, have access to whatever they need to be good mothers and all that kind of stuff in the human side. But that, that doesn't justify us doing, not doing something on the, on the animal agriculture side. Very good, Will. Very good, Nina. Thank you very much. Abby, we'll turn it back to you to kind of wrap up the webinar, if you could, please. I will. Thank you, Mike. Nina, thank you so much for answering all these questions. And it really, we had a great, a big audience online and you guys asked so many really smart and inquisitive questions. So thank you for your participation today. We really appreciate that. Um, once again, thank you to Dr. Nina von Kieserlink for, um, for presenting for us today and bringing up this topic that we know will be something we're talking about again in the future. There's no doubt about that. Also, thank you to the Dairy Cattle Welfare Council for sponsoring this, oh, this webinar today. We appreciate their support of our program. We're the second Monday of every month, so July 12th, we'll have a presentation by Carl Berge, the founder of the Save the Cows Network. Um, he'll be pre-presenting on three keys to exceptional hoof health, and that webinar will be, will be sponsored by HoofSync. And then in August, our presentation will be estimating energy supply and requirements of dairy cows a presentation given by Bill Weiss from the Ohio State University, and that webinar will be sponsored by QLF. So again, thank you for your sponsorship today to the Dairy Cattle Welfare Council. A big thank you to Dr. Von Kieserlink for sharing her research and insight on today's topic. And then last but not least, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for your interest in our topic and for making time to listen in. We're definitely grateful to be a small part of your day, and we hope that you found this presentation useful and insightful. So until next time, goodbye from all of us here at Hordes Dairyman and the University of Illinois. And once again, happy June Dairy Month.